For the past two decades, scientists have studied ice sheets to gain clues into the changing landscape of the Earth. But while the area of these sheets was widely observed, the thickness of the ice was never studied, until now. Cryosat 2, a satellite to be launched by the European Space Agency, will measure the thickness of ice, giving scientists new insight on how melting ice affects humans. I sat down with Duncan Wingham, lead scientist of the Cryosat 2 project and professor of climate science at University College London, to learn a thing or two about Earth exploration from space. Well, we, we have seen in the last decade uh, enormous changes in the ice masses on our planet, both in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. And we don't really know why those changes are occurring, and we don't really know what the implications for the rest of us those changes in the, in the poles of our planet are. So the aim of Cryosat is to make uh, measurements that haven't been made before of unprecedented accuracy from which we can make deductions about, for example, the implications of these changes on sea level and the implications of these changes on ocean currents which deliver heat to us, particularly in winter. We do it by bouncing a radar beam off the surface of the ice and measuring the very small difference, it is quite small, it's only about that big, uh, difference between the echo off the, the ice surface and the echo off the ocean surface. And as you know, ice floats. So by measuring that small difference, we can calculate how thick the ice is. So at any one point around the Earth, we can measure this small difference, and then we can calculate what the ice thickness must be in order to produce that difference. As the satellite moves along its path and the Earth spins underneath it, you can imagine it laying tracks down on the Earth, a bit like a ball of wool. So every time the satellite goes around, you get another strand of wool. And every month or so, if we average the picture across all those strands, we get a snapshot, as it were, of what the ice is doing in the Arctic that month. And then as month and month goes by and year goes, as year goes by, we build up a picture of how the ice is changing both in the year and between the years. How will Cryosat help us better understand climate change? Well, I think that the, the primary reason why people felt Cryosat was important was the concern, which still exists today, that large-scale changes in the Arctic, and, and in particular the generation of a large amount of fresh water due to ice melting, will alter ocean currents in the Atlantic. These currents generate about a third of the heat that keeps us warm in northern European latitudes. So in order for us to be able to study first how much fresh water may be coming out of the Arctic, we need to know how the ice is declining. And, and second, we need to be able to study the ocean currents of the ocean surface in order to determine what that transport is. There's been a lot of doubt surrounding climate change science recently. How will information coming from Cryosat uh, be perceived by the general public? Well, it's really no surprise, I think, now that we are seeing the growth of climate skepticism because the impact of warming the atmosphere is being felt on every aspect of life today, whether one is talking about building, whether one's talking about transport, whether one's talking about food production or energy production. And no doubt this now touches on moneyed and political interests. And so climate has become a political question because it bears on very significant sums of money and difficult negotiations between nation states. So, so in a sense, that it's now mainstream debate in, in the media and everywhere else is no surprise at all. And it's a measure of the enormous contribution that climate science has made that, that we are at that point. Of course, people tend to view science with suspicion because, largely because it's something they don't understand. But science itself isn't something that can be brushed away. And simply ignoring it isn't going to make it go away. Sooner or later, the effects of this climate change are going to become so obvious to everybody that there will be nothing left to discuss. The only pity is that when this happens, the damage will be so large that there'll be little we can do about it. Now, the launch has been in the works for uh, several years now. There was a, a failed attempt in 2005. What has happened since then? 
Christ said at the moment is, is cost because because we had a failure, we, we effectively have two missions now and I guess it's going to end up at a bill like two hundred and fifty million euros. Um, that sounds a lot, of course, and in some ways it is a lot, but one has to compare the cost of knowing what's going to happen with the cost of not knowing what's going to happen. And if one looks at, for example, the implications of the Stern report, one can see that the cost of not doing things is about a hundred or a thousand times larger than the cost of doing things. And so, in the long run, Kaisat will be a very, very cost-effective way of understanding what we're doing to our planet. But those of us who went through the failure first time round are feeling a little bit nervous this time. But I do hope that we don't have to wait another five years to get this mission into space. <laughs>